If you want a long career in distance running, having strong bones is key. In this video, we're gonna break down what goes into developing strong bones based off of research and practical experience. We're gonna highlight some key papers, all that you can find in the description, and then we're gonna go through how to critically analyze these principles when it comes to your or your patient's training. Your bones are made up of two different types of tissues that have different functions. The first type is cortical bone. Cortical bone wraps around the outside of your bones and provides a lot of strength. The inside of your bones is closer to this sponge. It's more adaptable. It's able to bend and move. It's got a little bit more give to it, but it's not as strong. Having both types of bone tissue is important because it allows you to be able to move and be adaptable while also being strong. This popsicle stick is gonna represent one of your bones. When you move, you place a small amount of stress on your skeleton. That stress creates some strain or deformation. For most of life, you stress your skeleton, it has to deal with a small amount of strain, and it returns back to normal. If you progressively increase the stress over your life, your bones will get stronger, denser, bigger, adapting to the demands you place on them. When you're trying to understand bone strength, you have to understand stress and strain. Now, if you took physics in school, you probably remember Young's modulus or the stress-strain curve, a visual representation of how different materials behave to being stressed. This tissue strain happens from three different things in life. Muscle contractions is the biggest stress on your skeleton, followed by impact if you're running or jumping, and finally, the specific gravity of Earth. Different structures behave differently when stressed. You have some structures that can deal with a high amount of stress with minimal amounts of strain. That's your cortical bone. You have other tissues that can deal with a large amount of strain or deformation, but very little stress. That's your spongy bone. When you go out for a run or go through a lift in the gym, you behave in the elastic region of that stress strain curve. You've stressed your body enough to adapt, but it's allowed to return back to normal. Tissue strain in this region is below the yield point or the point where you cannot return to that normal baseline state. When you're undergoing a training session, your body and brain have to do a massive amount of calculus to figure out, are we going to build up or are we going to break down? This graphic adapted from Pettit and colleagues shows the complexity of what your brain has to do when interpreting tissue strain or exercise. There's a bunch of different types of strain you need to understand. First is strain magnitude or how much strain occurs. Second is strain rate or how fast that strain occurs. There's strain frequency or how often that strain occurs. And then there's strain volume, which is the total combination of magnitude, frequency, and rate. When looking at running, think the overall training load. We can do these practically with an exercise like a calf raise. You could increase the strain magnitude by adding more weight to the movement. You could increase the strain rate by adding more speed to the movement. You could increase the strain frequency or the number of repetitions that you're performing. You could increase the strain volume by increasing the total amount of sessions over time. Bones prefer high amounts of strain magnitude, high strain rates with minimal volume, which sounds like the exact opposite of distance running. Bone adapts in a site-specific manner, which means if you're concerned about your hips and pelvis, you probably need to be deadlifting. If you're concerned about your femur, you probably need to be squatting. And if you're concerned about your lower leg, you probably need to be doing calf raises because those exercises load those specific bones. And it's been shown that even within specific bones, specific locations, will get stronger and denser compared to the entire bone. This is your femur. This is your femoral head, your femoral neck, and your femoral shaft. When you are upright and weight-bearing, most of the stress goes to your medial femoral neck and down the medial aspect of your femur. The medial femoral neck is stronger and denser than the lateral femoral neck because it gets stressed. Bone also adapts in a direction-specific manner. If we go back to physics classes, there's different types of stresses that you have to deal with. There's compression or squeezing forces. There's tensile forces or pulling forces. There's shear forces and there's torsional forces. Forces. Specific locations within your bones adapt to these specific forces. My six-year-old loves wrestling. There's a big brawl happening. You've got John Cena, we've got Roman Reigns, and we've got Mr. Kevin Owens. They're used to the wrestlers coming right this way, right down the main runway into the ring. But they aren't prepared if something different happens. Seth Rollins sneaks into the back of the ring where they're not used to it, they're not ready for it. He can easily take all three of them out. Your bones adapt specifically to what they have to deal with, 
not to anything else. This concept is part of the reason why I don't think runners should change the way they run unless they're dealing with pain. Because your skeleton and the rest of your body tissues groove into the movements that you place on them. I mentioned this earlier, but bone doesn't like a lot of volume. This is likely due to the unique nature of bone's mechanosensitivity. Bone gets bored very quickly with being stressed. Sponge Daddy is gonna represent your bones. Your bones require a lot of blood, and when you exercise, blood soaks into the loaded tissues. After just a few reps, your bones get very saturated and can't take on any more blood. Like if we load this sponge with water, but just continue to pour, your bones won't be able to soak all of this up. And this mechanosensitivity is one of the reasons why runners might not build as strong skeletons as these multi-directional athletes. Because if you're playing soccer or basketball or something that involves more stopping, starting, and rest breaks, you likely have an opportunity to allow those bones to resensitize and be ready for more stress. Instead of running where you are consistently pushing through fatigue with a lot of repetitions. Being active grows a stronger skeleton. Your bones will adapt in a site-specific and a direction-specific manner. And your bones prefer high strain magnitude, high strain rate with rest breaks. We often forget that your skeleton has two different jobs. One is the mechanical stuff that we already covered, but the non-mechanical roles of your skeleton are likely even more important. Your skeleton is a reservoir for minerals, helps regulate calcium and phosphorus, and supports red blood cell production. And this is one of my favorite quotes from the articles that I included in the description. Bone growth development and preservation is largely reliant upon hormonal regulation, globally controlling skeletal homeostasis, somewhat independent of mechanical loads throughout the lifespan in order to facilitate non-mechanical functions of bone. Your skeleton is gonna prioritize the non-mechanical functions of your body over the mechanical functions. Your body's priorities go something like this. Keep you alive, make babies, adapt to training, in that order. So now we have to talk about hormones. A hormone is a chemical messenger produced in one location that affects another location in your body. You have lots of different hormones for lots of different things. There are a few that you need to understand when thinking about a strong skeleton. Growth regulators, gonadal regulators, and calcitropic regulators. And this graphic highlights the different effects that these types of hormones have on your bones. These hormones can be out of whack for lots of different reasons. You could have a systemic condition, you could be on certain medications that alter them. What I see the most, runners that are under fueling that cause drastic changes in their hormonal function that eventually affect their bones. We see hormone issues present themselves in different ways. We also see specific things in males versus females that you need to be paying attention to. In females, we'll see changes in their menstrual function. And in males, we'll see changes in their sex drive. And lucky for us, there's helpful questions that have been published to try to analyze if someone is dealing with hormone disruption. I include these questions in my paper paperwork, I encourage you to do that as well. If we don't make smart decisions in training and we don't scream for these potential non-mechanical problems, your bones can break. Now this can all seem very bleak, but there are actionable things that you can do to make sure that you're growing a strong skeleton and ensure you're not seeing me as a patient with a new stress fracture. First, understand that life loads are more important than your training loads. This cup is gonna represent when life is going great. And this seltzer tablet, you making sensible training decisions leading up to your race. Sensible training, in a good environment, nothing bad happens. But if we're in an environment of underfueling, or we're taking medications that sap your skeleton, or you don't have a good understanding of your past medical history, that environment environment can quickly take your ideal training and turn it into a problem. So you can have all the right training, but if your environment sucks, your body will pull resources from your bones other places. So if life is stressful, you have to adjust your training. I've seen this often with runners that are going through relationship struggles, that are dealing with a new job or environment, that are taking care of a sick loved one. Life is more stressful, and so we have to adjust training to meet that environment. As healthcare providers, I can't change what's going on in my patients' lives, but I can help them try to orient around what life is like, understanding that often those are temporary situations. I've harped on running not being great for your bones, but there are things that you can do to make sure that you're improving your bone density and strength while training. It's been shown that runners that lift weight have denser bones, shown by this graphic from Duplantine colleagues. 
So doing something that doesn't look like running can benefit you as a runner. With one of the easiest things being incorporating heavy resistance training, loading the bones you want strong. I spend a lot of my time writing strength plans for endurance athletes. A typical program focused on bone strength would look something like this. Three big movements, two to three sets, focusing on increasing weight every one to two weeks. The other thing that you can add to your programming is faster movements like plyometrics. Heavier lifting helps us with that strain magnitude. Faster movements like plyometrics help us with that strain rate. Both loading characteristics that your skeleton likes. I think it's great if you do this with a skilled trainer or strength and conditioning coach. When we look at data from Willie and Warden and colleagues, we see that having 24 hours between exercise sessions is helpful. Having three to eight hours between exercise sessions, if you're exercising multiple times in the day, keeping a full day off is beneficial. And making sure that you have some element of seasonality throughout your calendar year is crucial. Bone is complex and humans are complicated. Hopefully, this video has given you a few concepts and some practical help when attempting to grow a strong skeleton while running.